Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum. How's everybody? Let's wake everybody up. Tabir! All right, good, good, good. Alhamdulillah, that everybody's here. I'm very excited. We're trying to share because we care. And that's why we do the program, the Deen Show, which is viewed internationally all over the globe. And we're here with you guys. We're here with you guys. And I get to benefit first and foremost because I get to sit with some of the students of knowledge, people who have accepted Islam, and I get to soak in this knowledge and then press record and share with you. Today we're doing a live show. So for our youth that are out there struggling, it's difficult growing up in the West here. Many of the challenges, you have to wake up on time to make the prayer. You have to stay away from certain things. So there's a lot of do's and don'ts. So we want to give some encouragement not only to the youth, but also the parents who are here to try to understand the youth. So what better way than to get some advice from our brothers here who also have grown up in this culture. Myself included. I was born and raised here. I'm an American. And we can speak the, we speak the vernacular language. So sometimes when your father and mother are telling you this, that, and the other, and it goes in from one ear out the other, but when you're talking to somebody who can relate, inshallah, it sinks in a little bit better. So I had two of our brothers, inshallah, uh, who have been on the Dean Show, Muslim Bilal, Joshua, uh, Joshua Evans, and inshallah, soon to be uh, Omar Reagan. So we're going to start off by having them introduce themselves, starting from my right to the left. Go ahead. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillah alhamdulillah. Uh, my name is Yusha Evans, born and raised in South Carolina. I accepted Islam in 1998. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And have been working since then to share Islam. Go ahead, brother. Introduce yourself. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Omar Rigi. Alhamdulillah. And uh, my mother accepted Islam when I was five years old. So I grew up, grew up Muslim. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Muslim Bilal Chin. I was born and raised in the United Kingdom, London, South London. I embraced Islam in 2002. And alhamdulillah, the journey continues. So let's get straight into it. I'm going to be asking you guys some questions so the viewers here can get to benefit from the responses. Now you guys, growing up in the West, You've also faced some of those challenges. Alhamdulillah, many of us are still facing challenges to this day. It's a struggle. It's a jihad all the way till we visit that grave. So we want to do enough good to please our Creator before our, we meet our Creator. So we need that good advice. So as I mentioned, sometimes when you're getting advice from, a, from an old uncle, we respect our uncles from, you know, you guys ain't that old. But uh, when we get people who are more our age bracket or who've been there, done that, we, we kind of respect it a little bit better. So tell us, what were some of the challenges that you guys faced growing up here and how did you overcome these? Things such as going to the nightclubs, things as, you know, when people are in the masjid, you're out, you know, partying and hanging out and the call comes for, the, you know, the prayer, but then the friends are calling, you know, you to, to, to be out with them. So that's a dilemma that we're facing. How did you guys overcome that? Let's start with uh, let's start we start let's start with Mr. Bilal. Um, Subhanallah. For me, I was scared when I first became a Muslim. If I'm honest, I was scared of the rules. A brother was giving me dawah. I told him I'm I'm considering becoming a Muslim, and it's important in the mannerism which we give dawah because he scared me. He was telling he decided to tell me everything is haram, and. <laughs> So it's like, he said, like, this music that you're doing, this is haram, you know, you'd have to stop that. And also, this going out to clubs, etc., you'd have to stop that. And I said, okay, we'll go out, but I won't drink alcohol, you know, just to have a good time. No, 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 going out all together, forget the alcohol. I said, okay, what if my friend's birthday? He said, no, birthdays as well, forget that. <laughs> so everything seemed haram, and he said, just mixing in general, all these women, and... It scared me. You know when you're young, you, the world is like a playground to you and you just, you just see enjoyment in everything because you don't have much responsibilities at a young age. 
So you just want to have fun. And it sounded like everything that was fun was haram and everything that was fun and enjoyable, I can't do no more. So what's this life going to be like for me if I become a Muslim now at 19 years old? This life's going to be boring and it's going to be... Like I wanted to delay it to a later age in life. I said maybe I'll become a Muslim when I'm 30 or 40 after I've had all my fun. But we don't have this contract saying we're going to live for this long. So basically it was... It was the fear of death when I spoke to someone else. It was the fear of dying in that bad state and not having that time. You know, a lot of us think, oh, later on in life, people are born with think after I get married, after university, we delay, we don't hasten towards good. And it was the fear of dying and being raised on that day, Kiyama, when he was, the guy was giving me dawah with more wisdom. wisdom. He was explaining about being raised as like the winners or the loser. And it was the fear of being raised as a loser that just made me think like I have to try now. So I accepted it from 19 and the, the journey just started, the battle started. But believe me, it wasn't easy and it's still not easy. Like there's, there was many things that I was battling with. But for the, me as a rapper, it was when some young Muslims, sorry to get to the point, some young Muslims, I was doing itikaf in the mosque and it was the imam's children. And they came up to me and they recognized me as a rapper. Young Pakistani kids are like, oh, you're a rapper, you're a rapper, do a rap, do a rap. I said, no, nah, I didn't want to do it. You're embarrassing me. And I said, you recite some Quran. And they was reciting what Shamsi wa haha for me. And, I, and they said, don't you know it? I'm, my little brother knows it. It's in Juz Amr and he's five. So not knowing it, but knowing all that rap kind of like made me question like, I'm like, no, I can rap along to so much rap CDs, etc. But when the Quran plays, how long can I go on for? I don't. So it just made me question, where's my heart at? So it's just that. It was that battle, basically, like, where is your heart at? When the questions come to you, what did you really love in this life? Was it, you say we love Allah and the deen, but our actions are showing something different. Talk so is was, cheap. So yeah, talk is cheap. Kind of, yeah. You have any regrets? Any regrets? Yeah. You miss uh, any of the parties, some of the old friends? No, 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 no. There's no, there's no enjoyment in it. Like, no there's enjoyment. no enjoyment in it, not at all. So you're happy now? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Omar, listen, Alhamdulillah. talk to Alhamdulillah. Let's move on to our brother. How do you, we talk about the, the tantalization of this world. You, the, I mean, you're like right in it all. The Hollywood glitz and glamour and the movies made. And now it's like, are you going to where? To the after party. Is that what it's all about? Yeah. Now it's the red carpet and all the, you know, paparazzi. And it's like, you know, everything's mixed this, mixed that, all sort of martinis. And how do you not succumb to that and stay on the right way, the way that's pleasing to the Creator. Uh, SubhanAllah. Oh, man. Well, alhamdulillah, it's, um, it's a big problem, to be honest with everybody. You really have to... Let me tell you. I'm going to tell you a, sh a short story. You, you, it becomes a point where you start seeing yourself in the environment that you're in. And you, all of us have this voice on the right side of us to remind us, like, you shouldn't be here. You, should, you really shouldn't be here. <laughs> and then you're looking around. I, was, I went to this event, and alhamdulillah, I was, I was with, uh, oh, man. Um, it was Dave Chappelle. It was uh, Wesley Snipes. Um, we was there. It was Abdullah Chappelle was his brother. I was at this event, and we were going. We had good intentions. I mean, youngsters. We wanted to talk to, Prince Faisal was there with the Hollywood Studios, and I wrote the script, and I wanted to talk to him about doing some Muslim halal movies. That's what I wanted to do, and he had the money, and I wanted to talk to him, say, give it the money. <laughs> but I had to go into this, to this party, and it was on the Sunset Strip. And not Genuine was there, Lisa Ray was there, all these other celebrities was there, that, you know, you brothers have to lower our gaze. Sisters even have to lower their gaze with the genuine guy. We know. <laughs> but it was at this point when I, I realized that I was wasting my time. I was there. And look how I got the reminder. I'm standing there, and I felt so shame. Because it's the time when Michael Jackson was, had passed away. And I was, they was playing a Michael Jackson song, and I was, and this woman, she was tall, 
she she approached me and was like, "You're the only one dancing to Michael Jackson." I was like, "Oh, hold on, hold on." <laughs> Out of all the people, I'm thinking like I'm Muslim and I'm the one that's dancing to Michael Jackson. So then she's talking to me and I, I must have, I don't remember what I said, because I have to be honest, I don't remember what I said and she looked, she's like, you Muslim? I was like, oh, yeah. And she was very tall and she had this mini skirt on and she was like, she was a model and she said, I'm Muslim too. <laughs> I said, I'm alright. And then I was like, and she she tall, so I'm looking up to her, I was like, wow, what's going on? Okay. And then she said, I'm in Maghrib. And let me tell you, may Allah have mercy on her, because I didn't know what that meant, men Maghrib, right? And so I was like, you from Salat to Maghrib? <laughs> but, but then she said Morocco, and so I was like, wow. And I looked at it, and she said, please, this is what she honestly, Eddie, she looked at me and her eyes watered and she said, please say Fatiha with me. And I was touched, like, I was like, man, that's messed up, but <laughs> I didn't know, like, I really, I started thinking about all of the shuyuf and everything. Like, this, is this, what is, this has got to be ikhtilaf. <laughs> but, but I was like, well, I'm messed up and she's messed up too, so we might as well say Fatiha. <laughs> I said, Fatiha, and then she was like, I want to know what a masjid is and, and everything. And I said, wow, what if that was me? I walked away from her, and this, this, this lady was talking to me, and this guy was black, and he was looking, and then he, she took me to introduce him, me to him, and this guy, he was the manager in charge of Erica about doing everything. And he was like, you want a drink? I'm going to offer you a drink. It's real. It's an honor. When I turned the drink down, I was dishonoring him. It was like, I said, no, no, I don't drink. And everybody just <laughs> So I was like, you know, he was like, oh. And then the other lady was like, no, he's Muslim. And then he was like, oh, you Muslim? I'm Muslim too. So I'm like, I'm too late for the captain. <laughs> and he pulled out his Allah chain as if it was his badge. <laughs> to be like, bam. And he started talking to me in Arabic. And I was like, uh, and I was like, I don't understand. And the point that it got to me, I started looking around and I said, you know what? Allah Billah, there's a bunch of Muslims in here. <laughs> and look at how we look. And I don't look no better. I got to make a decision. Like, I do not want to just blend in with the crowd. I want to, I want to, that, that experience, it really bothered me because I was like, man, I look just like everybody else. I don't look like anybody that's making salat. That's a reminder of a law that, you know what I mean? Just, just like what I am, why? Like inspiring American Muslim youth. I don't look like that. I'm misrepresenting everything. And it really made me feel shame and it just stuck with me. It's a little funny, but it shook me. And it's very difficult to be in that kind of environment. I mean, I've done some films. I don't even tell you Muslims which film that I've done. Because I'd be like, oh, I would be like, I'm shamed. Just not even, I'm grateful that I didn't really have any bad scenes. But just because I was there. And then if you saw the movie, you'd be like, you was there? You know, it's just too much. It's really too much. And it, it comes a point where, I don't want to talk too, too long. It just comes a point where we have to make a commitment to being who we really truly are. Like we don't really realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the light. And they, they want the light, the people look for the light. But how am I gonna shine the light if I'm in the midst of all of this? It's, they gonna just block the light. And then nobody gonna be like, hey, move out the way and I'm gonna shine. It's not gonna work. It's just not gonna work. So we just can't be putting our, we gotta try our best, like, like Muslims said. We gotta try our best, because it's a constant struggle and be strong. Thank you, thank you. I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone. If a lies by my side, I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone. If a lies by my side, I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone. If a lies by my side, I am not afraid to stand alone.
I started asking deeper questions. The question I want people to really ask themselves is when you come back from a night on the town, you've been drinking, you've been boozing, you've been dancing, you've been hanging out with girls, guys, or whatever. Number one, did you improve yourself as a human being? Number two, did you contribute anything to the betterment of humanity? The amazing thing is, is that the most advanced studies in psychology about human happiness show that these are the two key factors in making people profoundly happy. I take five minutes out of my day and pray to the Creator and none of the creations and I feel a deep internal peace and I still have my normal life. Get the experience from Yusha Evans. You've been on The Dean Show before. Alhamdulillah, people can go to see your whole story at thedeanshow.com. So you also made a transition from living that lifestyle of chasing your lusts and desires. So in short, how did you overcome that to where you are today? What keeps you going? Uh, you know, 13 years ago, almost 14 years ago when I accepted Islam, I was at a point where I was trying to get out of that lifestyle. I, I really, you know, didn't have, realize I didn't have a place here in the, first, in the first place and I was striving to get out. And so when I found Islam, it was like finding home. You know, it was like I had found where I needed to be and belonged. But 14 years later, after going through so many different things in, in, within being a Muslim, dealing with my family, the biggest probably tribulation that came to me was not from non-Muslims, it wasn't from my family, it was from the Muslim community. Because when I first accepted Islam, this was before 9-11, there wasn't, you know, people weren't entering Islam in droves because Islam was on the media. No, I was just some weird white guy, you know, in, in, in the masjid the only white guy in the masjid and it was somewhat hard for me to find my place you know it was almost like I was still an outsider I had left my whole way of life and become an outsider to everyone else and then I was still an outsider in the Islamic community and everybody was giving me everything read this read that study this you need to know this you need to know that I didn't know where to start where, where A, B, C, D went anything so 14 years later what I think really keeps me going in being able to go and try to bring other people out of that darkness um, is one day I was sitting on a plane half asleep and this is something that I, that, that I think all of us especially really quickly show of hands how many people here born in Islam? born and raised in Islam so how many people came to Islam reverts very small number in the room, so I'm speaking to all of you born and raised in Islam. I was sitting on a plane one day half asleep and for some reason remembering I was preparing for a lecture and I was thinking about the, the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, about Allah Azza wa having written everything in a book that is only with him 50,000 years before he initiated creation. Everything that would happen. As we know the Prophet والسلام, said the first thing Allah created was the qalam, the pin. And then he told the pin to write. The pin said, write what? He said, write everything. Everything. And then I thought to myself, you know what? Somewhere in that book, Allah wrote that you would be guided. Somewhere in that book, Allah wrote and had written that you would be guided. That you would come out from that darkness and into the light of Islam and be where you are right now. And that kind of overwhelmed me. Because now having really understood who my creator is, really understanding Allah, that Allah would consider guiding someone like me out of all of humanity is, is really a favor and a ni'mah that I, I didn't do anything to deserve. I don't do anything to continue to deserve it, but yet that guidance is still there. And so now it becomes more of an issue to me not to struggle to stay inside of this man anymore, but to struggle each and every day to repay a debt that I can never repay to Allah because he's given me something that's priceless which is guidance and there is nothing I can do in a myriad of lifetimes
to repay that debt. So every morning I wake up now with the consideration that what am I going to do today to try to repay that gift that was given to me before I was even thought of, before the creation was thought of, where Allah had written down in a book that is only with Him that I would be guided. And for all of you here in this room, Allah wrote your name in that book too. That name, your name was written in that book too. So Allah put in consideration to bring you to Islam. And I don't know what any of you have done to deserve it, but if you are like I am, we didn't do anything to deserve it. It is truly a gift. It is truly a ni'mah that was given to us. And every single day that we wake up and we're able to say, La ilaha illallah, it's another gift. And, and that's really the beautiful treasure of Islam that we try to share with the world, that it is a gift. And it was given to me 14 years ago. And I tried to give it to as many people as I can. That, that's the only thing that keeps me going. If not, I don't even know what I would be doing right now. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Inshallah, that I don't want to have all the fun, so we're going to try to take a couple questions. We have a few minutes left on the topic to learn from their experiences. Do we have any sisters? We'll start with the sisters. Any sisters? A sister wants to ask a question, maybe for a friend who's being challenged by today's time. It's maybe she, her friend just barely got her here, and all the other friends are trying to have her at that party, but she's here. So some advice from the brothers that are saved. Anybody raise your hand, sister over there, okay. Go ahead, ask your question. Thank you so much. Um, I always struggle with that gift. I was born a Muslim, and I'm so thankful that I'm a Muslim. But why are we blessed to be Muslim and some that have had the same exposure as we all did, but their hearts are blinded. Why was I so lucky to be a Muslim? And some people that have tried to share my luckiness with them, they don't see it, so. Beautiful question, go ahead. Uh, if you, all three of you can maybe hit it for one minute each before we take another question, go ahead. Allah. Um. I don't think I fully understood the question. Why are we so lucky to be guided? She wants to share it with, you know, the guidance, hidayah is from Allah. Like, all we can do is convey a message. The guidance is from Allah, so we have to do our duty. It's not really our duty to change the world and to get frustrated or angry at the rest of the world, etc. We can just convey a message in the best manner, in manners we have possible and hope that Allah guides them. And the way I say is to, to change ourselves by having beautiful characters and by having the best of manners. And then inshallah it will attract them to want to join us or to be interested in what it is that we have. Yep. <laughs> That's right. Now I agree, he said everything. I mean, alhamdulillah, he said everything. Be grateful. And then if you're grateful, then you're happy. And you're happy and you're smiling. And I think what happens to a lot of people is they get turned off from Islam because they don't, they don't see Muslims smiling. You know, so I think that we have to smile more and show that we are really truly excited and grateful to Allah for him even making us Muslim. And that, you know, that we know because this is natural. To want to party, to want to drink, to want to have fun, to want to have, do haram all of the time is not who we are as human beings. It's not who Allah created as man. That's things that, uh, like in Surah Tanas, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that uh, we seek refuge in Allah from uh, Sudur and Nas, the whispers from that go into the heart. That feeling or that emotion is not real. It's whispered into us. So... Being Muslim is natural. <laughs> we gotta, we're going to pass it to Yusha Evans. Masha. Um, as far as the question, why are we the lucky ones, that's a question that we, we can't really answer. I can't even tell you why I'm on guidance. So, um, but when it comes to us sharing the message of Islam with people, even our Muslim 
family members that are not practicing, friends that are not practicing, you know, they are exposed to the same things we're exposed to, but yet they are not coming on board. You know, this is a question that plagued our beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as well. And Allah Azzawajal revealed to him, will you destroy yourselves over their footsteps? Will you destroy yourself over their footsteps, their comings and goings, and their running away from you? Allah told him, you cannot guide whomever you wish. It is I who guide whomever I wish. And I know best who is guided, and I know who is best astray. One thing I tried to share with everyone, and this is maybe something you can take home with you tonight. When I meet people and give them da'wah, I tell them something very simple. That look, when it comes to your relationship with your creator, it is personal relationship. It is personal. It doesn't have anything to do with me. It doesn't have anything to do with your father, your brother, your sister, your mother. This is a relationship between you and the one who created you. So I implore you to do something. If you really want to know the truth about your life and your existence, then go to the one who created you. Simply, humbly ask him to guide you to the truth. And whosoever asks that with sincerity, and they are willing to follow that path wherever it may lead, it will lead to guidance. Because Allah says we guide those who walk aright. So that is simply and humbly those who wish to follow the path of Allah Azzawajal, then Allah gives them the and the effort to be able to go on that path. We're taking one question from one of the brothers. Let me get a hand. You have a question? Anybody have a question from this side? Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, young brother. So, so, like, so we give dialogue to non Muslims and uh, co workers uh, and friends. But it's sometimes it's hard if you're not offended and trying to uh, offend them. You know, you don't want to. I mean, we know that God is one and you try to send that message. How do we send that message without offending them? And also, sometimes it, they agree with the message, but they don't. It's the identity because the Prophet was an Arab or, you know, most Muslims are associated with that. So how do, they, how do we fight that identity battle and how do we speak to them without offending them? Um, because of what we know. Who wants to pick that up? We got 30 seconds to answer the question. You shall start off with you, then we go to, to your right. 30 seconds. Uh, one, one problem we have had here in, in, in the West a lot with da'wah is to learn how to make Islam universal. Because Islam is a universal religion for everyone. Not content to any time or place. It's not constricted to any time or place. It's not an Arab religion. It's not a Pakistani religion. But when it comes to sharing the message without being overbearing, Allah Azza wa Jal has given us that key very simply when he commanded us, Udu'u ila sabir rabbika bil hikmah. The first command was called to the way of your Lord with wisdom. And wisdom is, according to the best definition we give in the English language, wisdom is to use knowledge at the right place at the right time with due discretion. So we have to know how to share Islam with our brothers and sisters in humanity. And I finish with this last statement that we do need to be trained in da'wah. Da'wah is something that needs to be learned. It is a technique, it is a skill, it is a proficiency. But lastly, I want to ex explain to you the last hadith is that the Prophet ﷺ said, as you all know, you do not love for your brother, what you, said, you do not have true belief until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. Imam al-Nawi ta'ala, when Interpreting this hadith, he said brotherhood in this sense meant general. That you do not have true iman until you love for your fellow human being what you love for yourself. And what we love for ourselves is jannah. So we should love that for them too and show them sincerity that we have care and concern for you. Let me finish this here considering that we're almost out of time. Let's wrap it up with this question. For the male or female that have been down and out, they feel like they hit rock bottom. She's been used and abused by the man. She shouldn't have been there. And now she's just got a bad relationship. And you know what? She's trying to get her act straight. And he's also manipulated with the women. And he's been to all the parties. And now he's like, you know what? I, I just don't want to do it no more. And he's feeling this guilt inside. She's feeling this guilt inside. But they, they feel like, you know what? Is there hope for me? Is there hope? They want to know. You've been there. You've done that. Give some advice. Let's wrap up with this. Uh, to be fast. I'd say like, after hardship comes ease and sometimes the hardships of this life should be what drives us to want to work harder for the next life. 
because we know what Allah has prepared. So read about Jannah and paradise on what's prepared for you. And when you suffer in this life and you're going through all that hardship, that should make you want to work harder to get to Jannah. So the first thing is to start with the prayer. If the prayer is good, then everything else will be good, inshallah. If the prayer is bad, then everything else will go bad. Never give up. Never give up. Never give up. Do that action. Turn to Allah. I know so many people have come to me and said they sin and they feel so bad that they feel they're too bad to even pray. Look, this deed is for the sake of Allah and it's in accordance with the sunnah. Go make wudu and pray. Allah will, can accept it from you, inshallah. We're wrapping up. Yep. We're wrapping up. Go ahead. Pray, pray, pray. And, and you know what, brother? Because he got the Omar Regan shirt on. <laughs> um, when you find that you're upsetting them, the people that you're talking to, stop. Tell them, oh, I don't mean to offend you. I don't mean to upset you. That's not, I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize. When they see that you're so passionate about something that you want to control yourself from getting into a continued arguing, that's da'wah in itself. And then people, don't stop. Keep on praying because there's hope for all of us. I feel like I done done so much dirt. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved me, he can save everybody. I promise you. Just pray. And uh, let's close out with you. Is there hope? They did everything under the sun and now they're feeling like they're falling in despair. Is there hope? Is there still hope? I'm going to quote one of my dearest friends who will be with us here, inshallah ta'ala. One of my dear, beloved friends, Imam Saraj. There's always hope because if Allah Azza wa Jal wished to create a creation that did not sin, he had already done that. He had already done that with his angels. And when Allah said, I will create and make a khalifa on earth, the angels didn't understand. They said, why will you come create one that will commit mischief? Allah's simple response was, I know what you do not know. Because Allah Azza wa Jal can be known through his greatness with his creation of the heavens and the earth and the angels. He can be known through many of his beautiful attributes. But one of his greatest attributes only becomes perfected through this creation of the insan and jinn. And that is his attribute of mercy. The ability to forgive. The ability to turn to those who turn to him and repent. If Allah did not create people who would sin, no one would ever understand. Allah's mercy. No one would ever understand Allah's forgiveness. So if you commit sin, know you are doing that which is part of your nature, but it does not become part of your identity until you return to Allah Azza wa Jal and seek His forgiveness and repentance. And lastly, the Prophet ﷺ said, if the son of Adam did not commit sin, Allah would just, just get rid of that creation and replace them with people who would commit sin so that they would turn to him and repent to him because indeed in our repentance we show the great need that we have for Allah and we allow Allah Azawajal to show the greatness of his mercy. I want to thank our guests. Thank you very much. May Allah, the creator of the heavens and earth, reward you. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank all of you guys for sitting attentively and let's take the advice, let's work to please our creator before we meet our creator by doing all the wonderful things, the beautiful things as he's told us to do so we can be in Jannah, so we can be in Jannah because this life is short and it will all end very soon. So let's not get hypnotized by the tantalization and the delights of this world. Let's get hypnotized by Jannah and strive to be the best, the best in character, the best in deeds and actions before that angel of death comes to snatch our soul out of our body. Thank you very much. May Allah reward you. Peace. Assalamu alaikum. Peace, the solution for humanity. Peace. It is what we need for you and me. Peace, the solution for humanity. Eternally, oh peace. Peace is what we need, oh peace, oh peace. Open your eyes, your heart, your mind. Seek the truth and you will find The day is clear from night as dark
greatness is 